Betty, can you review for us how your family came to South Deerfield and some of the various homes you've lived in during your time here in South Deerfield? My grandfather came from Ireland, landed on, in the part of New York that was not Ellis Island. Ellis Island was not there at that time. It wasn't Castle Garden. It's just when it was the Battery. And he made his way to Whiteley and he bought a half a house. And after he'd worked for eight years and earned enough money, he bought the other half of the house. My other grandfather was, um, came in as a Yankee. Uh, he, we're related to uh, Captain Miles Standish, who came on the, on the Mayflower. And my father's family has been in Bradstreet for all of their life. Um, my mother and father moved from Whiteley to South Deerfield when I was two years old at 230 North Main Street. And uh, we lived there until uh, the house was determined that they were going to make a two apartment house, or four apartment house out of it. And we moved across the driveway into the house that was perpendicular to the driveway. And we lived there for about three years while we were building our house. And my father um, had been one of the people who had gone to the Quabbin Reservoir when he worked for uh, William E. Gass, and they brought all of the house, well, the door frames, the window structures, and doors, and anything else that they could use in doing over um, Old Deerfield, for instance. And they stacked them in a big pile right across the street in a lot that became my brother's house lot. And then I bought the lot directly across the street from them, and that's where we built our house. And my dad built our house with the help of my brothers. And um, everybody in the neighborhood that was willing to help, I can remember being up on top of the roof, pounding nails in and dropped the hammer, and I had to go all the way into the cellar to pick the hammer up. And when did your family move to Eastern Avenue? In 1950, we built the oh, house. Oh, in the 1950s. Yes. And it really wasn't developed yet? No, no, there wasn't. So much of the development took place because of the GIs coming back, is that true? Um, mainly Grave Street uh, built houses for the GIs because they were small, um, what they called a government house at that time. And that's what the, 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 the veterans went into at that time. Our house and, um, on Eastern Avenue more came after families had settled down and there were bigger houses being built. And right now, there were 48 houses beyond us to the mountain that were built after we built our house. Were there really distinct neighborhoods that you recognized in those days? You said, oh, I live in East Deerfield, I live in Pine Nook, or was it South Deerfield? Well, they were kind of um, separated from us by miles. The kids all rode in on buses, but you know, they rode in on their particular bus. Um, we didn't associate with them excepting in school if they became a schoolmate from East Deerfield we knew who they were but um, otherwise it was hard because we didn't have a car there was no way we could get so she had a bicycle bicycles we got around on roller skates but that was in town some of the kids go to Deerfield Academy from oh yes people did in those days but of course that was private school and that was um, in, in those days, I don't know that they charged tuition, but there were a few people, and I, I think we had about three young men who went to Deerfield Academy that went from eighth grade and, and enrolled at Deerfield Academy. But that was pretty unusual, yes? Uh, it was in those days, yes, yes. Uh -huh. And, and I'm, I'm still in touch with one of those young men who lives in California. What were some of the schools, can you tell us the schools in town, the old grammar school where it was and the other schools that kids went to? The old grammar school on Main Street is where I went to first and second grade. And then at third through eighth grade was in the old South Deerfield Elementary School, which was on the, foot, <coughs> the footprint of the now police department and the town offices. <coughs> uh, that was a large second two-story building, um, had a big old coal-fired furnace that you could smell all over the building. But um, there were two, when, when my grade, when we entered school from the very first time, 
was, my class was split into two grades because there were so many of us. So there were two grades of us all the way through eighth grade. And then when we went to high school, we melded as one because some, of course, we lost some of those to other um, schools. There was also an elementary school in Deerfield itself. In the, yes, in, in Old Deerfield. That, that was an elementary school um, way back from, in fact, there were a lot of little what we call village schools around town. There was one up in uh, East Deerfield. There was one in West Deerfield. Um, there was one in Wap, what we call Wapping, which is between here and Deerfield. Um, and those schools were one-room schools that had grades one through eight, because in those days we didn't have kindergarten. And there were many children who went to those schools and then came to Deerfield High School as a high school student. So you had these little schools. How, oh, many, yes. how many children do you think were in each of these little schools? Well, whatever was in the neighborhood. Really? They, they and they'd have, te they'd have teachers for all the grades? It, yes, they had. And you know, the teacher always was the one who built the fire in the morning. She came in and she had to do that. She had to sweep the floors. She had to um, attend to any sick children because there were no nurses in those days. She did all of the jobs that one would expect a mother to do in the classroom at the time. And those children, you'd think they wouldn't learn, but they did. Those kids learned an awful lot. They were just as well equipped when they came into high school as those of us who were in single, uh, single classes uh, in town. And, but I believe that, um, oh, there were, there were a number of them. And there was one up in Conway called Beldenville, and Conway had them too. They had them in the out areas. But what I'm assuming is it was like the old style, one teacher That's with, with all these different That's ages right. together in one class? That's right. And up to what period? Would you, up to what year was oh, this going on? I would on say from the, from the late 1800s. Until when in Deerfield? Until, probably until the, um, they went into the old Deerfield Elementary School. See, they would split and go elementary and then those around us, uh, Pine Nook and so on, would come to South Deerfield. What year was that about? Well, that was, I went to school in the um, early 1930s, um, 1930, I think I was in 31, 32, I was in second grade, so it had to be before then, because I came in as first grade So those person. little schools no longer operated? Oh, no, no, they okay. finished up when, um, when, when the consolidation happened in the school department, and all of the kids in Old Deerfield in surrounding areas of Old Deerfield came to Old Deerfield, and all the kids in, in the surrounding areas of South Deerfield came to South Deerfield. That's when the little one-room schools ceased to exist. Were most of your teachers, by the way, Yankees? You know, like um, Protestant stock, or were they... Uh, mix. Everybody, was it mixed? Yeah, everybody. Everybody had a, um, a different talent. Um, you know, some might be accomplished in music, and they, they imparted that upon their students, or some were in musical instruments, and that sometimes, you know, they'd bring a cornet or a trumpet or something in and, and show the kids how those things work. So you had a very mixed... Very mixed, and they were all women. They were all women. All women teachers. All women in the outer schools, yes. Yep. How about in the elementary school? Growing? Well, the elementary school, the, the principal was usually a man. And it, I had all women teachers all the way through school, except for my seventh and eighth grade was shared by two teachers, a woman and a man, and really? he was the principal. Yes. Is that right? Do you remember there being much discipline problems in school? No, no. Kid, because kids were disciplined at home, and they they knew if the teacher reported back to the parents that the youngster was misbehaving, that it was the woodshed for them, and they didn't want that. The woodshed means. Oh yes. Means we they... didn't. We did not spare the rod and spoil the child in those days. No. No. And this, a, and this, a, was, this was common that kids got everybody spanked? Everybody disciplined spanked. their kids. And of course, some people went to the extreme, but that was very rare. Um, most often, it was just a whack across the backside, and um, the kid got the message. <clears throat> and was it didn't much... take many of them to do it, I'll tell you. Um, another side question about the police department. Where was the police department located, and how much of a police department was there in? Deerfield or South Deerfield, and was there much need for a police department back in the 30s, 40s, oh, 50s? Oh, yes. Yes, there was. Um, the police department at one time was underneath the Produce National Bank, and at, they also had um, offices over what I call the Fertilizer Building, which is the CESA building now. They also were um, 
in a building, well, first of all, let me go back. At that time, there was always a night officer who worked a 12-hour shift, and the day officer who was the chief who worked a 12-hour shift. And as, as crime developed, um, there was a need for more people to be officers, and so they started training officers. What year is that, and what kind of crimes are you referring to? I can't remember any, well, back in the 19, early 1950s, there was only um, a night officer and a day officer. One. Yes, one, one each, so it, there were two people on duty. Because I know when we used to come back from USO meetings, we would always go and, and sit down and talk with Pete Kaczewski, because he was up and we were up, and we felt like talking, and we'd go sit down with him and- At the police department. At the police department. You could department. just go in and chat. Yes, yeah, we did. But they had, in the center of town, because the cruiser was always parked right in the center of town, um, by the area by the monuments. Uh -huh. And if a police officer was needed, there was a floodlight overhead that would come on, and he knew when that light came on, he needed to go and make a telephone call and find out what the emergency was. And that's the way they signaled their officer. That was before officers had telephones, before um, there was communication systems and, uh, that they ha now have today. And, and that's considered archaic, but that's the way we operated. Uh-huh. And um, what kind of crimes do you remember in the 50s? Was there much crime? Well, the you know, around uh, Halloween, there was a lot of kids who, I can remember adults. I mean, serious crime, serious crime. Not so much serious crime. We didn't, we know we never locked our doors in those days because nobody ever entered. I never had a key to the house when we lived up on North Main Street, never. It wasn't until we came down to Eastern Avenue and we thought we were kind of in foreign territory and we better lock our house, and we started locking the house at that time. But people never locked their houses, and I'll bet you 99% of them never had keys. But people, they were, of course there were automobile accidents, which the police had to attend to, and the Bloody Brook Corner was a when Route 5 and 10 went through, there was an accident on that thing about every week, and serious accidents. Many people were killed there. And um, that always, and of course you didn't have an ambulance service at that time, and they used to have to load people in the back ends of, of people's cars and rush them to the hospital because that's the only way you could get to the hospital. There was no ambulance on duty. It wasn't until the Lions Club came into town and decided that we needed an ambulance, raised funds for it, and that was the start of the ambulance program. Would and you my, know what year that was approximately? My brother was, was, was a, a head lion, and I think he was a head lion at that time. Um, I can't, I'd have to go back in, in the records, but it was back um, in the, at least the 1950s. Already in the 1950s yes. they started getting an ambulance Yes, squad. yes. And where was the volunteer fire department located? It was located in a building that was in the center of town, and it was next to the Bloody Brook, next to the Petican building, and the, what we call the old fertilizer building, also it was the old electrolyte building, right there in the center of town across from Fisher's Garage. And it was a volunteer fire department, and um, they used to, originally they pulled the wagon by hand because there were no um, horses that they had stable, and they used to do that and then it got horses to pull the wagons, and then they finally got the, the fire equipment that was in the form of a truck. Mm -hmm. Who were some of the police, police chiefs you remember going back? Well, I remember Chief Edward Redman. I remember Chief uh, Ralph Morrissey. Um, and then, um, well, there was, there was David Bell who came into town and um, in fact, I was with a police officer who had served under David Bell the last three weeks. And uh, he was here for a while. And um, now is John Pachurik. And I can't tell you who were, my, my mind just has slipped on who was in between uh, Chief Morrissey and, and Chief Redmond and uh, Chief Bell and the current people. I think they called him Waz. Chief oh, Waz. Chief Was, yes. yes. I can't he forget was, Was. He comes to visit me very frequently. Oh, does he really? Oh, yes. He still comes. As, as a member of Triad, yes. Uh huh. Yep. So this was a very social town. People very, knew each very other. Social. You would get together for dances as a community. And Redmond's Hall was a mecca of 
Well, all the Polish weddings were held there on the second floor, and when they were, they opened up all the windows, and everybody in town knew there was a Polish wedding going on because the music would go all day long, and they'd party all day. Also, it was a place that people had meetings. Uh, as a church, we had no place to gather for, well, like a, a bazaar or a, a crack fair or something of that nature. So every year we used to have a bazaar and we had it up there on the second floor. And people would come and um, participate. We always had a, a show. I saw my first movie at Redmond's Hall sitting on a, what I call a Samson chair uh, in the in that area. What year and what movie? Oh, I don't remember the movie, what but I, I couldn't have been more than five or six years old when I did that, because that was what kind of got my interest going and on. what year were you five years old again? Um, what year was that? Well, I was born in 1928, so, so about 1933, 19, yeah, 33, 33, 34 and, and a movie must have cost maybe a nickel? Um, for a, When I was go, going up and going to Greenfield on the bus, if you had a dollar, you could buy a round trip ticket on the bus. You could get your fare into the movies. You could get a box of popcorn. And when you got out, you could have enough money left over for a dish of ice cream for a dollar. For a dollar. Yes. And how much would you be earning a week or a day? Oh, not much. You know, we earned 30 cents, 40 cents an hour for, for babysitting. It wasn't much. But everything went into the piggy bank and it got stored except for what we needed for clothes. Uh -huh. So as an aside, so entertainment, you'd go to Greenfield? Yes, we'd, we rode to Greenfield on the bus. What else was there? there were, what, what was the movie theater? Oh, there, the were garden? Three, three the movie, garden? there were three movie theaters in Greenfield at one time. The Garden, the Lawler, and the Victoria. Uh, the Garden is currently where it was located, but it was a one theater, and it was a beautiful theater. It ha they had the effects that when you sat there and looked up, the clouds went through the sky and you could see the stars sparkling. And the sides were made like a village with the balconies on each side. And they were just lighted just enough so you had a, 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 a dusk scene in a village. And you were sitting out there in the open air looking up. What about with, dances? Um, oh, not so much dances, but roller skating. Roller, roller skating at the gables which is up, you know where the lighthouse is up on there on North Mains, up on, uh, on the way to Greenfield? Yeah. Okay, well, the, the big, where, where Billadou has his auction gallery, that's the roller skating. That, that was, was the roller, roller skating, skating rink? Yes. Oh, and that went on for years. And everybody came from all the towns around, Turner's Falls, Miller's Falls, Greenfield, South Deerfield. You, you, they had regular um, dance sessions. They had, um, the, people became very proficient at roller skating. And it was, a, it was held more than just Saturday night. It was held during the week. And um, just a lot of people took advantage of it. They also had dances there? Not so much dances there. Dances were more at the Redmond's Hall, upstairs on the second floor. That's where the dances were held. Or the school gymnasium. When, when Deerfield High School was a school and we had the old gymnasium, that's where all of our dances were held, which was underground. Down, she was on the, on the base, the basement floor. It's also at the base of the mountain. Wasn't there an entertainment center there where the trolley went? Yes, the, um, at the base of the mountain was a pavilion that was built um, in the 1930s to house the CCC, which was the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was hired to build the road up on top of Mount, to the top of Mount Sugarloaf. Now there had always been a hotel and a road up on top of Sugarloaf since the 1860s because Jay Jewett's uh, relatives started, Ever Jewett started one of those hotels and it went on for years and they drew all of the supplies up there by horse and wagon. They had, uh, there was a dance floor up there because they had dances. Uh, people would go up um, base, and, and there was a hotel. They stayed there overnight in the early years. And it was because of the scenic view, it was, it was well known far and wide and, and continues to be this day. Um, that view is a gorgeous view. What happened to this pavilion? The pavilion, after it housed the CCC, then became a dance, a dance pavilion. And the trolley came up from Northampton through the river road, pulled up at the base of that pavilion, let off all of the young people, 
they went to the dances there. The trolley went through South Deerfield, went through Old Deerfield, on its way to Greenfield. And on the back leg of that, when it was coming back through, they got on board again and rode back down to Waitley to their homes. And that's the way many of people got around town, was on that trolley. What were the hotels in town, and um, what happened to them all? Well, to begin with, there was the Hayden Hotel and the Lathrop Hotel. And the Lathrop goes back to the, oh, the late 1700s, 1760, and then uh, into the 1800s when uh, people came along and improved that building. Uh, and it went through um, a number of changes from the Lathrop to the Bloody Brook to the Lathrop to the Bloody Brook. Um, and Located where? It was all situated in the same spot. Which the, is? right in the center of South Deerfield, facing the common on North Main Street, uh, on the corner of North Main Street and Elm Street. But it was, it was a big two and three story hotel at one time, had a big huge cupola on the top. Um, there were four significant fires uh, that burned uh, the, the hotel enough so that it had to be rebuilt. And each time they rebuilt it, it, it developed a little bit of a different configuration. It went from a, a, a small country inn to a big hotel with a cupola on top, back down to the small country inn. So this was a very successful hotel? Oh, it was very successful. And people came from New York or everywhere, Boston? Everywhere, everywhere. Anybody and who traveled through the area. And of course, with the advent of Deerfield Academy, there were people who did come through town because they had to come from Springfield or New York or Boston. And therefore, there was, there was a lot of transient uh, people, a lot of transients there. They would pick up the trolley where, if they're coming from New York? If they came, they probably would come into Springfield from New York, change trolleys, come up through. Uh, and at that time, it come up through the River Road, which is parallel to the Connecticut River. Yeah. And um, in between the river and Route 91, now located, um, that came up at the base of Sugarloaf Mountain, came through the center of South Deerfield, went up through Old Deerfield, and wound up in Greenfield. and possibly went on to Brattleboro. I don't have any information about where it went from Greenfield. But many times the, the return train would, you know, would come down at a convenient time so that if you were just coming into town for groceries or something, you could turn around and take the trolley. It the was trolley a single car. trolley. Single trolley car, yeah. And it went on Sugarloaf too, correct? Sugarloaf Street, yes. And there's, there's numerous pictures of the trolley being derailed in the wintertime when evidently the snow was so deep that it took the trolley off the tracks, and they had to bring a crew in to, to hoist the trolley back onto the tracks again. And uh, Was the trolley man a popular figure in town? Can you remember these people? I only knew one trolley man, and he was from Conway. Um, unfortunately, he had a bad accident and no longer could, could be uh -huh. the conductor on the trolley. But yes, he rode for a number of years. And this was used by local people to get around. Yes. The trolley was yes. what you took to oh, Northampton, yeah. to Greenfield. Like a bus like a bus, because there were no buses in those days. It wasn't until Fisher's Garage came in and established Pocumptic Stages and ran that regular route from Springfield to, to Brattleboro, Vermont every day. And I mean, they went. They had a good schedule. You could go to work and come back home on What became schedule. of the trolleys? They sound like a wonderful thing to have around. Oh, but trolleys went out of style because automobiles replaced the trolleys. I mean, horse and wagon, trolleys replaced the horse and wagon. And then the automobiles replaced the trolleys. And there was no longer a need for it because then everybody was starting to own a car. What about trains, Amtrak and the different train systems coming up? There here? were two tracks, the Boston and Maine Railroad ran through and then there was a second one, the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad that ran through. But the New York, New Haven and Hartford veered off and went on up through Conway and on up to Shelburne Falls and had a extensive, um, bridging of their track that they had that I don't know how that ever held up under the weight of a train, but it did. And that was a very popular line because that got transportation of goods up to Shelburne Falls in the, in the hill towns. Um, the New Boston and Maine went to um, Brattleboro and then it veered off in Greenfield and went to Boston. So there was a spur that went to Boston. So you could, you could take the train from here to Greenfield, transfer, and go to Boston. These two train lines both stopped in South Deerfield? Both stopped in South Deerfield, three of them. 
Well, well Boston and Maine and in New York, New Haven and Hartford. And they stopped here because of the hotels? And they stopped here because? Be well, maybe because th that's, they, they sent the onions out on, on board train. They, they, um. they might have sent tobacco out on board train. Um, they, they might have sent uh, crops, potatoes. Potatoes got distributed throughout the, the not only this area, but you know, there was a, the market in Springfield, a market in Boston. So there had to be a way of, of shipping those because there were not the trucking, the overland trucking lines that there are today to transport those things. A lot of goods went by, by freight train. Uh, every train had a, a freight, couple of freight cars, a baggage car, a mail car, and passenger cars. So, Tell us about the mail car. Well, in, at times whenever the train did not stop in South Deerfield, the way that they got the mail out was to bag it up at the post office and put it on an arm extending out over the railroad tracks. And if the train was not stopping, it would come through with a catcher arm from the mail car and grab it as it passed by and it would swing back into the car and that's the way they would sort the mail. So by the time they got to Greenfield, they would have Greenfield's mail all sorted and ready to be taken off and distributed to Greenfield. The same as on the opposite direction. Let's talk about transportation. Since you've mentioned five and 10 and the cars going to Greenfield to Northampton and the trains, let's go back a ways to when you were a youngster. And um, how did people get around? Were there horse and buggies back in those days? Horse and buggy primarily before the automobile. Now, my father had a motorcycle in the 1920s, and he had um, a car. He had an open touring car at that time, but that wasn't the first car because there were some older cars. Um, my brothers inherited a 1920 Ford. It was a coupe with a rumble seat in it and it had a, a, a fabric top on it. It wasn't a, a hard top. So there were those kinds of vehicles that were around. This is the 1940s we're talking the, oh, about? Oh, no, no, this goes back to the 20s, late, late teens and early 20s. What would a car cost, you remember at all, in those days? Somewhere in the neighborhood between 400 and $600. You could buy, you could a buy new a Ford for then. You yes. could. Yes, you could. And in the town of South Deerfield, what percentage of people had a car? How many people would you say were driving around? In the early days, not many. It was only the, the people who were affluent, who had money that they could afford to buy a car. Um, a, the, the horse and, and wagon, or horse and buggy, was a popular way of getting around. And, and speaking of transportation and the railroads, my grandfather uh, left home early, went to work in Hartford, Connecticut for the um, typewriter company, Underwood uh, typewriter company, and he did not learn to drive, never obtained a license, but he wanted to come visit his mother who lived in Whiteley. So he rode the train up when he came to the South Deerfield station. Out in back of the Hotel Warren was the Skibitsky Farm Supply, which, which we call Farm Supply Building. It was actually the, um, the stable where the horses were kept, and he would rent a horse and a buggy and he would go down and visit his, his mother for the weekend and then return on Sunday night, turn in the horse and buggy, climb on the train and get back to Hartford. And that's the way he visited his mother all throughout his life. Uh, did people, most people have a horse or were they just a couple of stables? Oh, no, no, they, everybody had a everybody horse. Everybody had a horse. Well, because they were used in, also in farming. They had farm animals and then they had horses that were the, the, the sleigh animals, the, the wagon animals that, they, that were uh, adaptable to being hitched up. Um, the farm animals were a little bit different because they pulled the plows out in the fields because there were no mechanical devices in those days. So you had to have an animal that was trained to follow the straight and narrow rather than, um, well, they answered commands too, but a buggy operation was a little different than the farm animal. Did you tell me it was your grandfather who used to have the horse and he would make you know plow the fields himself oh yes yes this was common uh, this just my grandfather and my great-grandfather Harris because they raised potatoes and as I said there were no modern conveniences in those days it had to be they had to weed and um, it, they could hold potatoes up to a certain point but then they had to do what they call lay in the row by which meant they throw the dirt up around the base of the plant to to uh, neutralize it and keep it until it, it produced, grew to be 
harvested and then they had to go out, dig those potatoes, pick them up into a wagon, bring them in, sort them, and then grade them and send them off to the... Labor intensive. Oh, very labor intensive. Everybody's intensive. working. Very. Step. And everybody in the family worked. Everybody did. Can you recall the tobacco farms and as a child, seeing the farmers working and the laborers working, can you tell us what it was like in South Deerfield? And people, did youngsters like yourself work on tobacco? There were a number of what we called um, uh, tobacco factories, factories where the load of, of to, well, first of all, let me go back to growing the tobacco. The tobacco in those days was all open. There was no shade grown early on. And then later on, when the um, farmers from the, the, the cigar and cigarette makers came into this area, they decided that the leaf of the tobacco grown here was a prime leaf, and it became the wrapper for the cigars. So that became a good cash crop. Now, there was a long way from the planting of the tobacco, the hoeing, and then finally when it grew, in the olden days, they used to do what they called slap it. And there was a slap with a arrow, like an arrow point on it, and the stalks were impaled on that slat, and many stalks were impaled. And when the, the length of the slat, which was about three feet long, when that became full, then they would take it out in the barn and go up. Somebody had to be up in the upper uh, rows of the barn, and you'd hand the, the slats up to them, and they would hang it up to dry. And they would fill the whole barn this way. Now, also, they did venting of the barn. All of the barns had, oh, probably a foot wide doors on them so that they all could be opened up to provide ventilation to cure the tobacco. And it had to be cured before it could be stripped. Now once it came time in the fall, usually sometime around the first week of November, which they used to call the tobacco damp because that's when they always had fog and rain and everything. And when the tobacco damp came, that allowed them to take those uh, slats down and take the tobacco off without it pulverizing in their hands. So then that became pliable and they could strip the leaves off of the stalks and they put them into a bin and it was graded by the tobacco company and then it was bundled up and that's the way they sold their tobacco. Now I have a story, I have a story to tell that one year in November it got to be awfully cold and it was freezing and they needed to take the tobacco down. So what they did was they backed a wagon up to the barn and they loaded all of the slats onto the, well not all, all of it, but in loads, onto the tobacco, of the tobacco, onto the wagons, and they brought it to my grandmother's kitchen. And the, everybody came from the neighborhood and they all came in and they stripped tobacco in the kitchen. And there was probably a jug of cider at their feet when they were doing this. And they managed to get the whole crop stripped under warm conditions where they didn't pulverize it. It was then in its still pristine state. And then it became, it got sold to the tobacco dealers who came through, bought the tobacco and paid cash for the crops. Can you recall some of the big tobacco growers in the valley? Oh, there was Myers and Mendelssohn. There was, um, they were the M&M. There was, uh, oh, there were two or three large companies that grew uh, shade tobacco after the, after the, but the original farmers grew their crop in the open. Then they started doing crops under the shade of the netting mm -hmm. so that it became a better quality tobacco leaf for the cigar wrappers. And that's when Myers and Mendelssohn and two or three other very large companies came in and were, were boarded. They, they actually had places here, warehouses, where they would take the tobacco in and then ship it off to their um, cigarette or cigar factories, wherever. So would the small farmers sell to agents of these tobacco yes. people? Yes. The agents would come to their farms? Yes, everybody did. Everybody dealt through an agent when the crop was ready. And of course it was graded. You know, there were, there were some that, for instance, if you'd had a hailstone and you got leaf that was uh, pulverized or perforated with the hail, then that became an inferior quality. They might have been able to sell it, but not for as good a price. Were M and M local people, or people? no? They were um, a company that came in from Connecticut. Connecticut was also a big growing area. Uh -huh. um, um, and how was price determined? Do you know? 
Did they pay the farmers all the same based on the quality, or did they oh, vary? It was, it was usually based on the quality of the tobacco um, and the, um, you know, the, the degree of, of handling that they had used to prepare those for the bins so that there was not a lot of ripping and tearing of the leaves. Was there one season, or could you have more than one season to raise tobacco each year? No, just one season. And how much could an average small farmer, let's say, make from selling tobacco? You know, and what, what, what did that money mean, what they made? I can't give you an ex actual price, but I know that there were a number of farmers who reached what I would call the wealthy stage by growing tobacco every year, and of course every year growing a better crop and uh, selling and getting a better price for it. Because as, as the need for that type of cigar wrapper went up, the price also went up. And then of course there was the point where all of a sudden um, the shade growing stopped and the price of tobacco had deteriorated and they no longer grew tobacco in the quantity that they grew once upon a time here. Uh, can you speak about young people, your high school friends oh, or junior yes. high school working in the tobacco field? Was that very common? Yes, oh, definitely. That's, what, that's the way the kids earn their spending money. You know, their clothes for school or college. Um, there weren't a lot of jobs. Pickle Shop offered some jobs, but the tobacco, working under the shade grown, um, they worked hoeing, they worked um, uh, cutting the, the plant down, they worked then uh, getting it onto the wagon, being brought into the central point. Um, they also worked stripping tobacco. A lot of the kids did that. Of course, that was getting into the time of the year when they were all going to school. So mainly that was done by the elders, um, the, the families who had older people that were uh, able to do that at that time of the year. So most kids did work tobacco? Oh, yes. This was honorable. This tobacco, was something you did. Tobacco and cucumbers. You know, there was a cucumber picking machine that you laid on your belly, and it was extended out like an airplane. And it used to go down the rows, and that's the way the kids, that's the way the pickle shop got their children, young children, to pick the cucumbers by laying on their bellies. And of course, they threw them into um, baskets. And then when the baskets got full, they got put into a hopper and they went into a truck. And by the truckload, they went to the pickle shop. They were paid by the basket? They were paid, no, they were paid by the hour. The kids were paid by, by the, the hour, hour. By the hour. And how old were these kids who were working these fields? Well, you had to have a work certificate to work if you were under if you were over 16 years old. You couldn't work. You weren't supposed to work under the age of 16. But if you had a, a hardy looking kid, um, he might have been able to to have gone in and got employment without a work certificate, which was not the way you're supposed to do things. But the school department issued those work certificates, and we had to have proof of age when a child came in to get a work certificate. So this is 1920s, 1930s, 1940s? Um, maybe not the work certificates so much in that era. But the kids but working the 30s, fields. 40s, and 50s, yes, because I issued many of those when I worked in the school department. Uh -huh. And uh, cucumbers, can you speak about how the pickles and all this came about here and what the process was? Well, it goes back to a pickle shop, Swan's Pickle, which was located over on Elm Street at one time. And then the, the D.M. Jewett Pickle Company came in. Uh, Delmer Jewett Sr. was the president, and his son, Delmer Jewett Jr., was the vice president. And then um, another uh, member of the family was another member of the organization. They ran the pickle shop when it was located um, approximately beside where the new highway department in the town of South Deerfield is on Merrigan Way in South Deerfield. It was located out in that field and it covered a great area because they had to have room for the vats which they put the cucumbers into in order to process them to, beginning, to, to the beginning stages of becoming a, a pickle. What happened to the Jewett family and the town of Deerfield in 1951? Can you speak about the ramifications of what happened in 1951 with the Jewetts? Yes, in 1951, Delmer Jewett Sr., Delmer Jewett Jr., uh, Mr. Edward Redman, who was both postmaster and chief of police, and Hollis Billings, who was the druggist in town, decided to fly in Delmer Jewett Jr.'s plane to Boston to see the Red Sox play. They saw the game and they started back that night, but weather closed in on them. 
So they decided to go back to Boston, get a hotel, stay overnight, and start out early in the morning. That happened, but when they started their flight back, they ran into bad weather again, had to direct the flight up over New Hampshire and crashed in Pepperell, killing all four members of the plane. After that, um, the, the pickle company kind of went, underwent a series of reorganization. Um, the younger brother came in to take over, Dana, but he was not a business, as an astute a business person as his older brother and his father was. Uh, his father had been in the business for a lot of years. Um, he had a house right there on Jewett Avenue that's always been known as the, as the Jewett House and uh, lived right opposite the, the factory. But the, um, the, the company never really, it, it, it prospered under Cain, but not to the extent it did under the Jewett's organization. What happened to the town of South Deerfield when it lost these four people? What actually happened to the whole sense of the town and the community? It was a tremendous sense of loss because we lost um, Mr. Redman, who was always the policeman on the corner. We lost uh, Hollis Billings, who was always the fr druggist in the drugstore. And old, what we had called old Delmer, um, used to always walk down street, dressed up in a business suit, go down either to the barber shop to sit down and chew the fat, or something of that nature where he would visit with other people. But he always walked with a pair of high-cut ball-bearing sneakers. That was his trademark. He never dressed up on his feet, always just in a suit. It was a tremendous loss for the it town. It was a tremendous loss for the town. We had four funerals within two days, and it was, it, it, the churches were just overloaded. Everybody turned out for it. It, uh, it was a time of sorrow, because we all lost our best friends. People, I lost Mr. Billings that I worked for. Um, I lost Chief Redman, who I knew from a child. And of course, the Jewets who had been here since, my, since I had been here, in, since we came here Early in 1930. 30s, 1930s. 1930. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tremendous loss. Tremendous loss. And you know the town, it took the town a lot of time before I can say that it began to accelerate up to a point. It, it never accelerated to the point it was under the Jewetts. But even to get started again, it, it was a slow process. And um, I think in, in a business sense we lost an awful lot because that was basically the termination of the old pickle shop that we called it, you called it the pickle shop. Uh -huh. Something else happened around the same time in 1951. You mentioned the bypass. Can you talk about how they redirected traffic and what happened with 5 and 10 and what the impact of that was on South Deerfield? 5 and 10 came down from Greenfield and it came in North Main Street over where the dry bridge, the dry bridge is the bridge that goes over the railroad crossing. And then it came down North Main Street and around that sharp corner at Kelleher's house and the Buddy Brook, what we call the Buddy Brook Corner. Um, and then continued on down through the center of town and of course there were traffic lights there. Um, it was um, the mainstream traffic area through town went down South Main Street and approximately opposite the north uh, fencing of Brookside Cemetery, it uh, diverted and went over the crossing and down through to where the diner is now and curved and went down through the Whateley Woods. And in fact, the, the roadway that goes between the diner and the uh, Route 91 was, the, was part of the main road. That was the, the footprint of the main road. And of course, traffic was um, then fed down through to Northampton, and uh, it was a busy corridor. Route 5 and 10 was, was the only tr through way through. You had to either go up through Conway and go into the hinterland and, and go down through Northampton, 
or you had to go out, uh, you had, well, you'd have to go off through the other towns, Turner's Falls, to get over to Amherst to get down to Springfield. So it was the main, through, a, through our uh, thoroughfare, through South Deerfield. And 116 was Sugarloaf? 116 was, part was, of Sugarloaf was Street? the Sugarloaf Street, but of course, what is now 116 at the foot of Mount Sugarloaf did not exist. There was no roadway there. The road went down through, from, from Sunderland Bridge, it took a turn to the left and went down through Hager Crossroad and through uh, East Waitley, and then you got over to Route 5 and 10. There was no throughway there. It came about when the, when the uh, uh, industrial park went in. Then that's when Route 116 went from the traffic light over to Sunderland. But always before that, it snaked around at the foot of Mount Sugarloaf through all those little side roads. And how was 5 and 10 redirected? What happened then? How did they Well, 5 and 10 then became the bypass, which was put in as a, as a straight highway from Greenfield right down through um, it, it, where it turned off onto North Main Street originally. It just kept going straight. And that's the, the place that comes by where um, Yankee Candle has their offices and where the new veterinarian is and where um, uh, the other businesses to the, by the fire station now, the new fire station. So one no longer needed to come through South Deerfield. No, no, and it didn't. But the only good thing about that was it cut down on the accidents. There were many, many fatalities on the, book, the Bloody Brook Corner. We've been talking about a lot of local businesses, but there were some major businesses, industry up in Greenfield. For instance, the tap and die industry. Can you describe the impact that had on local community and employment? It had a great deal, a great impact on local economy. Uh, it, uh, it provided employment for a lot of people in all the surrounding towns. It was um, a, a war effort because when the war came along and those factories geared up for taps and dies or for whatever was needed for the tanks, the trucks, the airplanes, whatever, um, they went into overdrive and they employed many people. Uh, both my brothers, my brother John worked for the Miller's Falls Tool Co Company. My brother Don worked for the Greenfield Tap and Die. My brother John's wife worked for the Miller's Falls Tool Company and my brother Don's wife, of course they weren't wives at that time, girlfriends at that time, worked for the Greenfield Tap and Die. Um, as the men went off to war, more women and older people went in to take their place and um, it became a very flourishing business. Uh, the Greenfield Tap and Die, which was located um, on um, Deerfield Street going into Greenfield um, at the Madison Circle area, um, I'm sorry, not Madison Circle, Meridian Street uh, era, um, was there for in all of my lifetime and only was torn down in recent years only to have a, a assisted living home center built up on it. The Miller's Falls Tool, by the same token, suffered the same situation. After it ceased to be a tool and die place, it was turned into an apartment building for the elderly much sooner than the Greenfield Tap and Die was. It was the forerunner of um, the, the conversion from a business building to an, a living quarters and was, was very popular, especially with the elderly people. Greenfield was really essential to the war effort. This Tap and Die was essential and major impact on the development of the war. Yes, the Tap and Die business was um, was a, gr a growing business. Very, um, so many people um, had employment through that. And then, of course, when they closed, the Millers Falls Tool moved down here to the Deerfield Industrial Park as the Rural Tool uh, building and went on to be sold and bought out by another company. And I believe it is now another business, not a tap and die building. So the tap and die industry at some point ended its presence here in the valley. Well, the, just ta the tap and die industry provided uh, the mecca for uh, 
the Greenfield being the hub, it was the shopping center too. Once the small town groceries ceased to exist, and there they were many of them in South Deerfield, but once they ceased to exist and people had cars and we became more mobile and there were more food products available, off we went to Greenfield to go shop at the, Green, at the uh, First National up there or the A&P store up there, which they had one of each. Or there was a market down on um, Federal Street that was a very going market. Um, these were all price, places that provided fresh produce. Um, Why did you prefer these big supermarkets to your local small because places? Because they provided more variety. You could, you could get a, two or three brands of flour, for instance, in order to make your bread. My mother had a preference for one brand of flour and it was not available here in town. So this would be like the 1950s, would you say, with the development? Oh, it was of, before that. Even before that, yes, before Greenfield that. had supermarkets. Yes, Greenfield had supermarkets. You had the development of, of the 5 and 10 eventually in 91, and people had cars. And people got to be mobile and they stopped walking and buying locally. There were three, five, and tens in Greenfield. There was Woolworth, Kresge's, and another one when I was growing up. And of course, all of that disappeared. There were many clothing stores. There were stores that sold evening gowns and, and, and tuxedos and that kind of thing for the graduation proms and so on. And, and basically, you could get everything in Greenfield. You, we did our, sh our uh, dry cleaning in Greenfield because there was no local point dry cleaning place. Uh, so there were a lot of businesses that existed there that we took advantage of. Why did people prefer Greenfield to going to Northampton, let's say? I don't know, perhaps, well, people did go to Northampton. It, it's not that Northampton was not a shopping center. However, it just so happened that we did our business in Greenfield. I think perhaps because of Greenfield being a little bit closer uh -huh. in the wartime, it took a little less gas to drive up there. Um, I can remember standing in line for silk stockings, as we called them in those days, before the pantyhose were available. And if you, if they are, if their allotment ended before the line did, then you did not get your stockings. You had to hopefully come back the next time when you could get up closer to the head of the line. Um, there were a lot of things like that. Clothing was not rationed, but it was not as available. Different styles became, well, became um, different kinds of things came out because of the length of the dresses requiring more goods that they shortened the lengths two or three times up above the knee and mm -hmm. then they went back Stop. down below. And that was wow. all due to the availability of material which, which was scarce at that time. Can you remember Wilson's department oh, store from yes. your childhood? Yes, Wilson's had been there before I was. And that was a very popular store yes. to go to. It's there, a family owned store. Yeah. There was Wilson's and Goodno's and, and Kolodny's and Albers all on the main street and they were all dress shops. Ann August too was Ann there? Ann August was there and there was another one, Peggy Parker, I believe is the name of it. It was further down uh, toward the west end of the street. And now having been here for quite a long time, grown up here and seen the changes, how do you feel about South Deerfield today? Well, I consider it my hometown because I've been here since I was two. I don't feel as though my leaving for vacations are going to alter that any. Um, I think that there are probably improvements that need to be made in town and I hope that, uh, that they are good improvements that are brought forth and uh, voted on and funded. Can you speak of a few things that you'd like to see happen in town? Well, I know that the, the common needs to have some th something done to make improvements to it. I don't really have any comments on it because I, I'm not really versed in that type of architecture or that type of fountain building or whatever, So, but I'd like to see something improved there. Um, I think the Christmas lighting needs to be improved, which I believe is, is in the works. Uh, there's a fund being established to put, um, to reestablish cables, uh, electricity onto the common so that the trees can be lighted. And, and when I was a kid, all those trees were always lighted on the common. 
And people decorated their houses more in the olden days. Everybody decorated their houses. And they had a prize for the best decoration in those days. The women's club or some group would get together and, and announce that they were going to go around at a certain time and judge, and then they would award the prizes. So that took place. And I don't, I see a little bit of it, but I don't see it to the degree that people used to go to. Let me, as an aside, mention that you've been active in the Deerfield Historical Commission as a commissioner and active in the growth in many different projects, yes. town surveys and uh, buildings in town, in the center. You've done a lot of work in town. Um, what changes have you seen in town? I mean, you said to me that there was a time you couldn't even buy a house because nobody no, was moving out of town. There never what were kinds, What kinds of things have, are very different to you now in town? There never were houses for sale in town because people came and moved in and stayed. Oh, they might have changed with their neighbor once in a while or, you know, moved across the street or something. But the houses were not for rent or for sale. And now, my goodness, you go down the street and one street will contain six or seven houses for sale. So for that reason, I'm seeing a change in the people. And also, it is in my neighborhood, I, I'm ashamed to say that I don't know some of my neighbors down the street. Because in the olden days, we used to conduct certain kinds of drives for money and you would have to go from house to house and you'd get a chance to meet the people. Or you had the paper boy who came in and he had to collect his money at the end of the week and you knew who he was. In fact, I had one family when I think of the five boys, I had every one of them for a paper boy and the two girls, the same thing. The whole family did papers and there were two or three families like that. It went from family to family. And, and that way you developed an attachment to everybody. You knew who the kids were. And um, in those days, um, again, the kids were, were free. They walked the streets. They came home from school. They walked to school. Nobody drove them to school in those days. We all walked. Everybody did. When I was at the high school, of course, I lived right two houses from the high school. But when I was at Eastern Avenue, I rode my bicycle to work because I worked at the high school. Um, so there's a difference in what's happening to the lifestyles of people, and I see that. Um, you don't see as many kids on the street as you used to see. So is that reflected in meetings, town meetings, and also the yearly meeting of the town? Are you seeing people not coming, not as interested in town? Is there a change? I think that perhaps there are a lot of people who are strangers to town first moving in that are reluctant to get involved in committees or in town politics and so on, and and I would urge people to to come forth because we need people. I mean, it's that's the the future is is what people do to improve our town. So what you're suggesting also is that people are not staying here that long. They're coming for a bunch of years for jobs or school or whatever, and they're uh, moving on. Yes. It's not that kind of roots of being rooted in the community like you grew up with. We, we were uh, a, a bedroom community for the university. A lot of young men would rent houses, you know, four or five of them would come in and, and reside there. Uh, people have apartments for rent and you do see that. I'm not seeing as much of that as I used to see. Um, that happened all over town before and I, and I don't think it's happening today. I may be mistaken. Mm -hmm. Can you um, reflect on the annual town meetings in terms of changes that you've seen? Yes, I see um, a dramatic decrease in the number of people who go to town meeting. I think that people, it's their town. I think people need to go to town meeting and vote. I think that's the purpose of town meeting is to inform them. And if they don't take advantage of it, shame on them because it's, they're not a part of the town if they don't vote. I want to thank you for this most inspired life you've shared with our town. You've really contributed greatly to, the, um, to what makes South Deerfield a generous, kind town. You've been a model and example for all of us. So I want to thank you and thank you for doing this interview today. Thank you, Ken.